Good morning, everybody, and welcome to webinar four in the Refuels Week series. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels. I'm coming at you live from the heart of the EU quarter for today's webinar, where we're going to be talking about how to make the energy transition a win-win situation for both the climate and jobs. And I'm thrilled to be able to tell you we have a real in-person panel with us today. Finally, we're slowly coming out of the pandemic restrictions. Uh, so we have a partially uh, physical panel today, which is fantastic. Uh, now today we're going to be talking about a big topic here in Brussels that people have been talking about for some time, which is how do you make sure that the energy transition works with the economy and not against it? Now, ensuring a just transition toward a climate neutral society and economy is one of the main objectives that policymakers here are pursuing. And they're working with businesses and civil society on that. But there's a lot of different opinions about how you ensure that uh, sustainable transition in an economically healthy way. And of course, there's also concerns that some of the opposition or some of the blocks expressed to climate action on these grounds are really just ways to hold up the energy transition. So we'll talk about that a bit today. Now, the impact of the energy transition on jobs, businesses, and local communities shouldn't be underestimated. An important number of jobs in the old or conventional industry are likely to be at risk in the EU with a direct impact on regional and local economies. A share of those job losses will be replaced in growing and new sectors, but not all workers will have the opportunity to take a new professional route. And indeed, professional skills, training and experience might not fit with the new sectors and proposed jobs. Designing support schemes for conventional industries to transform toward climate neutrality will undeniably contribute to our climate objectives, but will also enable the creation of new value change and stimulate economic growth. Such progressive transition of conventional sectors is likely to facilitate also the transition of workers, ensuring a just transition. So this session will look at these issues and in particular at the example of the shift from fossil to low carbon liquid fuels and assess the social and economic impact of this transition with a focus on new value chains, jobs, and the economic benefits for regional and local economies. So let me introduce you now to our panelists. Here in the studio with me, we have Judith Curtin Darling, former MEP and now Deputy Secreta Secretary General for Industrial, which represents workers, Alessandro Bartoloni, uh, Director of Fuels Europe, and joining us remotely, we have Benjamin Krieger, Head of Government Affairs at CLEPA, the European Automotive Suppliers Association. Welcome, everyone, near and far. Um, Benjamin, I want to start with a question for you, since you're joining us uh, remotely. Uh, you know, you're really working with, you're working with the automotive suppliers, so you're working with people in the industry that provide jobs. So how do you think the energy transition is going to create new job opportunities for automotive suppliers? Thank you, Dave, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and you mentioned, obviously, a very important topic for the industry. Uh, not only are we looking at a transition that is underway uh, in the area of uh, energy and powertrains that drive our vehicles, also digitalization is driving massive change in the industry. And in both these uh, areas, we see new job opportunities, new businesses uh, come, come to life, really. And I can say with a bit of pride, obviously, that our members are at the forefront uh, of, um, of discovering and unlocking these new opportunities. So if you're looking at the energy transition, as you say, Dave, uh, there are indeed new technologies, new uh, engineering challenges that need to be resolved. Uh, for example, inverters, battery management systems, thermal management, uh, just to name a few. And there we can say there is already a quite strong competition going on amongst the members of our industry to supply the best solutions at the most competitive prices uh, for to drive really uh, the vehicles of the future. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, a little, well, it's not easy for any of, uh, of the businesses, but it may, might be a little bit easier for the larger companies, the tier one suppliers, the ones 
that sell directly to the vehicle manufacturers. It becomes a bit more challenging for the many small and medium-sized enterprises that also uh, make up the backbone of the industry, really. And many of those are very much focused on the, uh, on the internal combustion engine, where Europe has a quite strong competitive edge uh, on, on global markets. So if you're looking at uh, the employment in the industry currently, we have about 1.7 million people that are directly employed by the automotive suppliers, uh, an estimated 340,000 to 500,000 of these jobs depend immediately on the internal combustion powertrains. Uh, and in Germany, that's about 130,000, for example, uh, that are directly related to this industry. So when we're looking at new job opportunities, uh, as I said, battery management systems, thermal management, inverters, uh, the, the software and electronic supply chains, then we would estimate uh, that there are strong new employment uh, opportunities. And there's a study, very interesting read by Fraunhofer Beschäftigung 2030, that estimates that about 40,000 jobs could uh, be created directly in these new areas with an additional 200,000 jobs uh, estimated in the wider supply chain, uh, looking at materials, machinery, and R&D certainly plays an important role there. What is important to note that this is an ideal scenario. So even under ideal assumptions that we would supply a, a, a strong proportion, almost everything for these new drivetrains here in Europe, even then, there is a strong risk that this new employment is not going to replace the employment that we see currently in the industry. And even if we can match the numbers, uh, then you have to take into account that we don't know where these new jobs will be created, when this will happen. It depends a lot on market uptake of new vehicles, new drivetrains. And also an important topic is the uh, the skills of workers. So it's not easy uh, for an engineer specializing on the mechanical internal combustion engine, for example, to just retrain and then take up a, a similar or comparable employment in new areas around the electric drivetrain. So there we see a transition. Uh, we have to manage this transition in order to ensure that it is a just one. Uh, the topic today is making this transition a win-win for the climate and the industry. And there, we would recommend uh, to take electrification of the drivetrain as the opportunity that it undeniably represents. It will contribute strongly to cutting CO2 emissions, but it is not the silver bullet, if you want. Uh, we have a very strong, very competitive industry here in Europe which will play a role in global markets for the foreseeable future. And we need to think about how to ensure that we harness our competitive power in order to achieve not only uh, climate neutral mobility, which we fully support by 2050, but we do this also with healthy employment and a healthy industry here in the European Union. And here the key word that we will certainly come to later on in the discussion is the question of defossilizing the energy supply and also the fuel supply. And then to leave it to the market to decide what the best solutions are, not only for uh, the climate, but also for, for employment in the industry. Thanks a lot. So Judith, Benjamin just mentioned there some of the role that employers can play, that industry can play, and also how you harness that competitive power. Um, from your perspective, how can we make sure that workers benefit from the energy transition and aren't harmed by it? So I guess from our perspective, we're not talking about a win-win um, um, kind of solution. We're talking about a triple win uh, solution because we want the, the win for the environment, uh, for the economy, but also socially. And that means that you have to put the same amount of energy in terms of policy into creating the framework for the social transition as you put in in terms of um, ensuring the competitiveness of industry and ensuring uh, that environmental standards are high enough that they actually um, meet the challenge of climate change. And for us, I mean, some of this is uh, the basic nuts and bolts of industrial relations. It's about having 
proper anticipation frameworks. What we're lacking in Europe at the moment in the automotive sector, but actually across the whole of, if you like, in Eurospeak, the mobility ecosystem, is we don't have a framework for anticipation and management of change in relation to climate change. And there, it's really important that workers have particular rights to be involved in determining their own future. Because where, where's the danger of an unjust transition when people aren't actually engaged in, um, in designing, co-designing the policies uh, which affect their jobs, their workplaces, um, and the future of their community. So that notion of co-designing, of worker participation for us, is absolutely the red line which has to run right through this if we're really serious about creating a just transition. I guess the, the challenge that we face is that we have um, European policies but a very mixed picture at the national level and within our industry. We have um, some companies which have taken extremely um, uh, strong positions in terms of their transition, um, but whether that translates down the whole of their supply chain is still a question for us. Uh, whether that transition mentality, the participation and the anticipation of change is including the suppliers in, the com uh, in that company is one dimension, but then regionally, this is going to have an enormous impact, very different impacts in different regions across Europe. We have from our French affiliate studies which show that 60% of the French automot automotive industry is linked to the internal combustion engine. So in terms of a country, that is an enormous change. Equally, you go to Central and Eastern Europe and you find that mainly um, the industry is made up of the supply chain. 95% of the industry in the Czech Republic in Slovakia, the decisions aren't made in the Czech Republic or Slovakia, they're made um, elsewhere higher up the chain. So organizing that transition means that we need to have really a framework and a, and a, a, a basic um, a set of rights at European level to ensure that workers in different regions, in different parts of the industry are able to, to benefit from, from being able to be part of the transition. Um, and, and in that way, we hope that um, this transition will be fair. But it's a, an enormous challenge. We're talking about 16 million workers in the mobility ecosystem, 8 million workers in the energy intensive industries, many of whom are in the supply chain into um, automotive and other vehicle manufacturing. So um, colossal challenge and for us, really we're still the poor relation in terms of the European policy framework. It's really interesting what you say about the geographic difference in terms of part of it being the supply chain, part of it being the automotive companies themselves. And that really affects where the policy is made because obviously it would be at a national level, it would be the countries with the automotive manufacturers rather than the suppliers. But I, I imagine this makes establishing an EU framework all the more important because all of these decisions have knock-on effects throughout, uh, throughout the EU. Um, Alessandro, let's turn to you next. Uh, coming from the perspective of the liquid fuel sector, how can that sector, how can liquid fuels create a win-win for climate and jobs? Uh, short answer, by progressively reduce, reducing the, uh, and bringing to net zero the emissions from transport uh, and by creating new high level, high content, uh, well paid jobs. Uh, if I can explain a little bit. So first of all, I, I guess the question is, uh, do we need uh, liquid fuels in the future? Not everybody is convinced in the debate that is taking place. Well, we believe that for certain application, simply you cannot replace energy in molecular forms. Uh, cannot replace molecules by electron because of the characteristic of liquid fuels. So starting from that, uh, um, what do you need to do? So why are they needed and how can they be consistent with, with the objective we all share of climate neutrality by 2050? Well, you need to remove the fossil part, the petroleum-based content of these fuels. 
And by the way, this will be the only way to decarbonize uh, during the transition to electrification, also road transport, because you have on the streets uh, an overwhelming majority of, uh, of internal combustion engine, and uh, these liquid fuels uh, can play a very important role for that, in addition, of course, to aviation and maritime, where for the foreseeable future, you don't have an alternative for, for liquid fuels. Sometimes uh, uh, I hear talking about uh, the, um, the Kodak moment or the cellular phone moment and say, well, refineries, fuels are a thing on the past, like Kodak. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a, a, a quite essential difference in that. Uh, Kodak uh, uh, was, uh, so in the case of Kodak, uh, it was uh, uh, replaced by a more technological advanced uh, technology uh, with improved functions mm -hmm. and uh, simply better in, in use, uh, in user friendly than the older technology. The same for cellular phones versus smartphones. This is not the case for uh, energy molecular, in molecular form cannot be replaced by electrons for many applications. So I think that it is, the comparison doesn't, uh, doesn't hold. But of course, uh, uh, we need to deeply transform refineries or the way you manufacture fuels. They cannot be the same as they used to be over the last century. So you need to, to move away from petroleum, if you want. And refineries should uh, transform, so from conventional refineries to uh, uh, non-petroleum, climate-neutral uh, energy hubs. I have a, a slide I would like to show if it's possible to illustrate what we mean by that. That's just the schematic, but you see there the, the big tower, typical of a refinery. And uh, what we have today is the, the black arrow, crude oil going in, and then you have uh, all your uh, supply chain uh, down to the market, uh, down to the petrol station, or to the petrochemical unit. If it is crude oil, uh, you release uh, uh, CO2 uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, and it's not a circular CO2, it is not a biogenic CO2. So we need progressively to reduce and then bring to zero crude oil, adapt, of course, the, the manufacturing uh, facilities, and replace uh, crude oil by sustainable biofeedstock, by recycled CO2, uh, even by waste. Also, the refinery should uh, more and more use renewable electricity, and uh, green and blue, blue hydrogen implement a CCS, a CCU. But the, the win-win for climate and economy is that uh, you reuse uh, all the downstream facilities, you know, liquid fuels are chemically the same, more or less, whether they come from crude oil or from, from biomass, it's liquid. They flow through the same pipelines, they are stored in the same terminals, they go to the same petrol station or to the, to the petrochemical factory. So this is what we call the, the energy hub, that can be the, the, the transformation of the conventional refineries. Quite interesting what you say about the Kodak moment because it's true that when we're talking about the transition for automobiles, we're really seeking to replicate the experience, right? I mean, that's where I think where we are with electric vehicles right now. We worry about uh, inferior user experience in terms of range anxiety and things like that. And we're, our objective is to get to a situation where the experience is the same as with an ICE, uh, but obviously cheaper for the user when they don't have to refuel. Um, but you don't have that element like you had with the Kodak moment where the experience for the user is going to be significantly different because, of course, going from film to uh, digital photos totally transformed the way we take photos. I remember when I was younger, I had to really take care. You, you really wanted to make sure the picture was really good before you hit that click button because you only had, I don't remember, was it 24 photos in a roll? Uh, and now we just uh, shoot with our phones all the time. It really transformed things. Um, so let's talk a bit about what some of the unforeseen effects I think that we've all been alluding to so far. So, um, you know, of course, when people talk about 
uh, shielding workers, shielding industries, shielding the economies from possible bad side effects from the energy transition. Let's, let's hone in on exactly what we're talking about there. Judith, maybe let me ask you first, what do you think some of the unforeseen and undesirable side effects could be from the energy transition for workers? So I guess um, the, the premise of your question of um, shielding is, uh, I would turn it on the other, the other direction in a way. I mean, what we are pressing for is a proactive agenda to ensure that you bring people with you. So that means a proactive agenda in terms of industrial policy, to be creating the jobs, to be supporting the innovation, to be ensuring the infrastructure. If you don't have that, the danger is that you have um, fragmentation across Europe, leader regions, um, leader part, if you like, leader and laggard, both geographically and socially. Those in society who are able to and can afford to uh, take advantage of innovations, can afford the technology, and those who are left with older technology paying higher price um, for, uh, for the use of that um, technology. So you need to have a proactive agenda in terms of um, the, uh, the innovation, the in industrial policy, the infrastructure um, framework. In terms of workers, that's, that proactiveness also needs to be there. And the danger of not doing that is that you create um, a situation in which we will have enormous restructuring with all of the impacts that that restructuring has in terms of local communities, societies. We're already seeing that, if we're honest. I mean, we're, this isn't a transition which is on the horizon and we're waiting to arrive. Our members are right in the middle of this transition today. We have restructuring in uh, different uh, companies across Europe linked to um, uh, the shift in the in mobility, the shift towards um, electrification. I guess our concern is that even the most optimistic scenario of uh, the transition in terms of passenger cars would uh, show that by 2030, we will still have about 67% of new vehicles will not be electrified. So we need to be ensuring that our policy framework includes a notion of uh, technology neutrality so that you're allowing the innovation, that proactive industrial policy to improve the situation across the whole of the fleet. Because many people, and particularly people who are buying second-hand cars, will still be driving vehicles which will need something um, that isn't electricity put into them to, to move them forward. So uh, we need to ensure that we don't end up in a situation where those who can't afford the, the kind of uh, the latest uh, technology are penalised uh, because that's, that is a very dangerous scenario socially. It will have many implications uh, for cohesion in our society, uh, but also political implications. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a really interesting point. And the thing that people warn about when we're talking about electric vehicles as the silver bullets that will solve everything and we don't need to think about just you know, ICEs or something of the past and we don't need to think about them anymore. And then you look at what's actually feasible for 2030. And as you say, th there's no way the whole fleet will be completely electric. Um, I, I want to go to uh, Benjamin. So Benjamin, the, uh, Judith mentioned that often the automotive suppliers and people in, throughout the value chain, they depend on decisions made uh, at, at the higher up portion of the value chain. Uh, so coming from the perspective of automotive, automotive suppliers, what do you think some of those potentially uh, unforeseen and undesirable side effects might be from the energy, transi energy transition that would particularly affect automotive suppliers? No, of course. Um, what well, well, I, th I think, uh, and I agree very much uh, with what Jude has just said, um, we need to ensure that we design the regulatory and policy framework, so the rules and regulations that come out of the, the European Commission and the discussion amongst the Parliament and the Council, and also then implementation in the Member States, we need to make sure that these rules and regulations allow for an efficient and effective as possible 
uh, market that define the objectives. The objective is clear. We want to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. And this is hugely challenging. Uh, this should not be forgotten. And it will increase costs. So there will be an impact on those who earn the least in our society, uh, who are the least affluent, uh, also a point just raised by, by Jude, and this is something that we need to take into account. So we have an interest to make sure that the policies that we design in the next couple of months are the least costly to society, and we achieve this by making them effective and efficient. So this is now very uh, general, uh, generic. How do we do that in practice? Uh, in the past, it was quite commonly accepted to define these objectives and then leave it to the market to decide, sorry, to decide what the best and most appropriate solutions are. The cost is, an, is a factor. Also, technological uh, considerations play a role. So it is as yet not the best solution to electrify, for example, heavy duty vehicles, because you would have a battery that is going to be very heavy and it's going to take a lot of the payload that you would actually like to use for for transporting goods. So you need more vehicles, uh, making the system less efficient. Is this a way that we want to go? Or are there technologically solutions, technological solutions that are better suited to the respective needs? Heavy duty vehicles are one example. Uh, people who need to travel long distance are a different example. Uh, for them, electrification might not be the best way forward. So are we acting responsibly by defining that we want to oblige everyone to use one technology solution, i.e. electrification? Or do we open the regulations and policies and make it a thing of the market to decide what is the best solution for me? And in order to do this, we need to ensure that the electricity that drives the electric vehicles and fuels that drive uh, vehicles with a combustion engine, internal combustion engine, that those run in a climate neutral fashion. And this is where, uh, where Alessandro comes in from the point of view of the refiners who say it is possible to defossilize the fuel supply by 2050, which means we can use the technology, the internal combustion engine in a climate neutral fashion. And there is no reason actually to not do that. And in that sense, we can make use of our European competitive edge in this technology, further also deliver it into the world markets, which I think we want to be a part of, and contribute to, uh, to cutting emissions and bringing them down to, uh, to climate neutrality. And like this, in this way, with a technology open policy, competition in the market to find the best suited and also the, the most cost effective solutions. This is how we prevent the unintended side effects. Otherwise, we risk going into a transition uh, where we not only a transition, but where we risk also disruption, uh, where there will be loss of employment in certain parts of the industry where we lose maybe access to, uh, to world markets that we need very much because we should not kick ourselves. The automotive industry is highly dependent on exporting to markets around the world. And those markets, many of them are on the way to increasing electrified uh, powertrains, but not all of them and not all of them to 100%. So we need a doses of pragmatism in how we design the way forward. Alessandro, what do you worry about most in terms of undesirable, unintended consequences when it comes to the liquid fuels perspective? The, the transition offers great opportunities, let's be clear, but risks are associated to, to the fact that uh, there may be, and sometimes we see alarming signals of deviation from the technology neutral approach. This is what uh, Benjamin was uh, was mentioning just a moment ago. But simply because uh, assumptions may prove wrong, uh, especially if the, um, the policy pushes focused on uh, one technology, 
pre-selected or let's say sort of centrally planned choice, this may, be, may, may not bring to, to the result that we are aiming for. Um, electrification clearly has many advantages, electrification of transport. In certain applications, it's unbeatable, I believe, but not for all. So this is the, the point when we say technology neutrality needs to stay there at the basis of the policy making of Europe. Uh, fuels, decarbonized fuels, we call them refuels, so uh, non-petroleum, uh, sustainable and renewable, uh, and uh, with very low associated emission fuels, uh, can play and will play a, an important role. They also are unbeatable for certain applications. So we need to leave the, the opportunity to, for investors to put their resources into this, into ma manufacturing this kind of products. Um, if this is not the case, again, technology neutrality is neglected, uh, you risk to have uh, investment uh, resources uh, allocated in sub-optimal uh, uh, way, destroying value, destroying economic value, reducing the competitiveness of our economy and destroying jobs, and, and that's extremely important. We may lose uh, uh, EU the leadership we have in some technologies, certainly in uh, uh, the, the diesel technologies, uh, Europe is um, number one, and also in the, in the um, field of fuels, of decarbonized fuels, this is something the world will more and more look at. So if we are first, if we develop these technologies, we, I think where we are already at the forefront, but we need now to, to invest at scale we need to have uh, to install big manufacturing units of uh, synthetic fuels, uh, of advanced biofuels. We need to create the supply chain. Uh, we need to develop these technologies for uh, waste to fuels. And we can be the first and be the best and lead the world. That's a wonderful opportunity for the European, uh, for the European economy. We should not uh, lose it for ideological reasons. Judith, I wanted to ask you about reskilling and retraining. We keep hearing that this is going to be really important when we're talking about the energy transition and people working in the old traditional sectors. Um, so how important is that going to be? How can we do it? And of course, not everyone will be able to do that. Some people will be at a certain age where they're just looking forward to retirement and they're saying, I'm not, I'm not going to reskill or retrain. I came into this industry with a certain expectation and I shouldn't have to. Um, so what do we do about those people also uh, who, who won't be able to reskill and retrain? Yeah, I mean, this is um, going to be one of the, this is why we think we need this extremely strong um, anticipation framework because the, the scale of, um, of training needs and skills needs, um, we already have skills gaps um, in, in many of our companies and parts of the sector. But I'd like to come back to a point that Benjamin made in his first comments, which is that what we're experiencing in the industry is a twin transition. And it's the combination of um, the green transition with the digital transition um, as well. And that has a, a major impact in terms of the whole skills agenda. Because we need to, what we're seeing is that through the um, transition, there are different jobs which will be needed, different sets of skills. So we need a, an accompaniment program which ensures that we're not seeing skills in effect as the bottleneck to change. You can have the innovation, our industries are extremely innovative. Our chemicals industry, our uh, petrochemicals industry in Europe is extremely innovative. Our automotive industry along the supply chain, extremely innovative. What we're hearing from our members in countries like Germany is that actually now skills is the major issue. And when you look at, for example, the European Batteries Alliance, of which Industrial Europe is a, is a member, um, they identified in their recent meeting uh, that we need something like 800,000 um, skilled workers to implement uh, Europe's battery ambitions in terms of electrification. So skills is colossal. So you can't do it in a piecemeal, depending on each company to take its responsibility fashion, because the scale of the challenge is just so uh, enormous. We need proper sectoral skills programs, 
We need um, an agenda which is about actually rights for workers, um, rights in terms of individual rights to training, um, individual learning accounts, ensuring that workers are able to use uh, downtime. You know, in, unfortunately, um, not, not just as a result of COVID, but also as, re as a result of uh, supply chain issues, um, semiconductors and other raw materials. Many workers in industry have seen um, themselves put onto short time arrangements or furlough arrangements because of issues related to, to supply chain. That time should be being used for training. We should be ensuring that we're already preparing, that we're anticipating. And you need, uh, you know, it's not just industry that uh, takes the lead, although industry has to be right at the front. You need the public authorities, the vocational education training centres, the social partners framing, and um, the trade unions involved uh, to, to ensure that all workers benefit uh, from this. And in that way, we can start to, to see how the, the training part of the jigsaw puzzle of how we get to decarbonisation can be, can be put in place. Um, but yeah, you're right. There will be workers who um, see this, like in any um, economic restructuring situation, they see this as an opportunity to, for a new adventure, um, maybe uh, for, for a new development. There will be those who are later. We have an age pyramid in our industry, which is also not that healthy, uh, we should say. We, should, we need to be bringing in more young people um, and, and, and graduates and, uh, and skilled um, uh, workers into the industry. So that makes the case all the stronger for having really this very strong just transition framework, which isn't just about people who lose their jobs, but it's actually about ensuring the transformation of the industry and that the job, people coming into the jobs are coming in at the bottom of the skills pipeline um, as well. And to top the cherry on the top, if you like, of this uh, policy is that the jobs of tomorrow have to be good quality jobs. We will only attract people into our industries if we're offering them a really good quality job with a future. Um, and that means that, that, you know, that industrial policy framework is so important to show to people that this isn't an, an industry of the past in decline. This, we're not talking about coal mines here. We're talking about an industry of the future where if we get this right now and we have this historic moment um, with this legislative package, the Fit to 55 um, package, we know this next decade is absolutely crucial. If we get it right, then we will be able to lead globally in these technologies. We will be exporting to the world and we will be offering the people who are coming into our industries a job not necessarily everybody wants a job for life, but the opportunity of a job for life if they want it um, in a really exciting um, industry. That's why um, you know, we're just so concerned that all of the focus at the moment is on targets and not on actually how we get to where we want to be in 2050. That industrial policy strategy, that social policy strategy, which is so vitally important to deliver the target in 2050. And that Fit for 55 package that Judith mentioned is this package that's supposed to be coming out from the Commission on July 14th. Rumors that it may be later, we'll see. But uh, that is basically the implementing legislation of the targets. So in the EU, we have these targets for 2030 and 2050 now. And this package will be about how you actually get there. So obviously, everyone is watching that very closely, both from civil society, climate campaigners, industry. It's a really important uh, piece of legislation. We'll see if we get it before the summer break. Um, Alessandro, from the liquid fuels perspective, um, when you're dealing with refineries and, and other types of industrial facilities, how does this question of reskilling and retraining factor in? Yeah, this is really a, a central question. But I would like to start with, uh, um, can I say, debunking one mi misperception that may be there regarding uh, refineries and the, the fuels business. So what is a refinery? A refinery is a, a, a high-tech, digitally advanced manufacturing facility. And it is run by highly qualified people. 
um, engineers, uh, technicians, uh, uh, physicists, uh, uh, chemists, uh, um, informatics, uh, really high level people. In fact, uh, um, back a few years ago, the European Commission issued their competitiveness, European competitiveness report. And they showed that uh, refineries uh, ranked uh, number two in Europe in terms of workforce uh, skills and education, and number one in process innovations. So this is to say that the people working in refineries uh, have uh, a, an average level of qualification very high. Now, uh, what does it mean? That they, they retrain to moving from uh, manufacturing fossil fuels uh, to manufacturing refuels uh, should be very feasible. What is important is that the job stays. And that, would be, that is really the risk, that you waste this uh, capital, this human capital you have created uh, of highly skilled people that can simply not find their job anymore because of uh, uh, biased, wrong policy decisions. So the technology neutrality we were mentioning before. It would be really a, a loss for the European economy if we don't allow the people working today in refineries to adapt to the, to, to the new cycle, to the low carbon fuels. Um, it is a problem, very correctly, Judith said, let's, talk of, let's think of the people working now, but let's think of the young people that start coming to the, um, we look for a job very soon. Well, refineries offer, and the, the, the manufacturing of refuels in the future will offer these attractive, interesting, uh, high content jobs uh, with the perspective that people may take or not, because people may like to, to change jobs, but they must be there, there must be an offer. And this is in the interest of our economy, of Europe. We cannot lose that. Um, Benjamin, I want to come to you with this question. Just a reminder for you guys at home, you guys can ask your questions to the panel just by typing them in on the screen where you're watching the video, and I will read them out to the panelists. Uh, go ahead and submit your questions, and I'll be asking those shortly. So Benjamin, uh, from your perspective from automotive suppliers, uh, how are you guys thinking about this whole question of reskilling and retraining? Well, reskilling and retraining is, of course, an important topic. Uh, and it is not only against the background of the uh, of energy transition, as you say, or the defossilization, uh, achieving climate neutrality in, in transport. Uh, another important driver of change is digitalization, which requires just as much or maybe even more uh, new skills, uh, makes others redundant, uh, as we as we see in uh, in, in defossilization. So reskilling. Uh, and training is an, is an extremely important uh, area, which our members certainly take very serious. Uh, and there's good work being done uh, in, uh, in cooperation with, uh, with European institutions. Uh, also with the, with the workers' representations, uh, there's excellent work done jointly uh, with the colleagues from industry on, uh, also with the uh, with the, the, the local and regional and national uh, affiliations in the member states. So this is something that we need to do anyway. Uh, the automotive suppliers industry and the automotive industry in, uh, in general has always been driven by innovation and is a highly innovative industry. Uh, we invest about 30 billion euro uh, annually in research and development, and this makes the automotive industry uh, the largest uh, investor, private investor into research and development in, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, contributing quite strongly, not only to innovation, uh, to patent registrations, but also to the competitiveness of the, uh, of the European Union as a location for manufacturing. Uh, so this is important, this plays a role. Uh, we are doing this and we have been doing this a good experience in, uh, in working on, on this field for, for the past years and decades, uh, but uh, it needs to stay manageable as a process. This transition, if driven too fast, with too much pressure, will result in a situation that will be more difficult uh, to manage. That's what I meant before when I said 
uh, there is a risk of disruption in the industry. And then we are not talking about uh, the skills anymore uh, and ensuring that we have the, the workers with the appropriate skill sets for the challenges that we need to resolve. Uh, but then we are looking at, uh, at a more problematic situation where there will be a loss or there may be a loss of, uh, of employment even across the EU. So we've mentioned a couple times what we're expecting from policymakers uh, in terms of guiding framework. Let's talk about what the companies are going to need to do because obviously a lot of this is going to fall on the industry itself. So Alessandro, Judith stressed that companies have a major role to play in bridging the investment gap in particular. So your industry has announced a potential investment plan of 650 billion euros. Can you elaborate on what exactly that would mean and how would you finance that? Yes, uh, you uh, quoted the, the clean fuels for all. It's the, the strategy we published uh, uh, back uh, uh, last year about uh, the transition, the transformation of our refineries. 650 billion euro is the, the result of, uh, I would say, a sort of free feasibility, pl plausibility uh, evolution of, uh, of spending in refineries to, as I said before, move away from petroleum and uh, start the production of, uh, of uh, carbon neutral fuels, so that in 2050 uh, all or almost all the fuels produced and brought to the market for transport would, would have a, a neutral impact on climate. 650 billion is uh, a huge amount of, uh, of funds uh, also for, for an industry like this. Uh, over over 20, 20 plus years, let's say, 30 years. Um, it is a big spending. What, what do we need? How do we finance that? Well, our industry traditionally has not never asked for support. In general, they look at the market, uh, the finance market, to, to finance investments, uh, or they, they look at their own resources. And this is the way, this is our, uh, let's say, our tradition of what we, we are going to do. However, there is a, an important uh, um, condition associated, or let's say an enabler, and that's the, the, the policy framework. Now, 14th of July, we are going to see a number of uh, regulations, either new or revised, and that are key, essential, to start providing the, the policy framework for, uh, for investments to flow, to unlock resources, as, uh, as people say, uh, for this kind of activity. So, we need absolutely this, this policy framework that will start, uh, will be proposed very soon. Uh, takes, uh, uh, is based on the technology neutrality I mentioned before and allows investors in refuels to, um, to have a return on their investment. So you need a carbon price which is high enough, stable enough, you need to be it's a negative uh, uh, assumption that you should not be banned from certain applications uh, in principle or for, uh, uh, for ideological reasons. Uh, you needed to have access uh, to, the, um, to the recovery fund. So what the member states uh, have prepared and presented to the commission include investments for the transformation of refineries. And this should be something that it is uh, included full title into, into the, the funds uh, made available for, uh, uh, for the restart of the economy. This is, these are the, the most important points. So in summary, uh, we don't want to have tailor-made support uh, subsidies. A subsidy is not a word that we, we, we use. We wanted to have a policy framework uh, that uh, supports investments uh, and it allows investment to get a return, an economic return. We want stability, predictability, um, and uh, a fair access to the resources made, away, made, made available for, uh, for the restart of our economy. Um, so my understanding is that those types of investments in updating refineries, that is compatible with the green ring fencing of the recovery funds. Is that your understanding as well? It is. I have no doubt that it is. 
it has to see whether this uh, will be agreed at uh, European Commission level. Yeah. Uh, as you know, the, the plants, the national plants are submitted uh, to the Commission. So in the end, the word is the Commission. Is this consistent or is it not? I think it would be unjustifiable if they are found uh, not consistent. I, I have seen in some of the, the national plants some investment which are really conducive to this decarbonization quick contribution to the decarbonization of transport, making low carbon fuels available for the uh, vehicles we have on the road. If they are not, uh, if, that, if they are denied access to these recovery funds, that would be a shame. Judith, um, from the perspective of workers, what, what role do you think companies and employers need to play in getting us through this transition and in particular, in terms of that investment need, um, do you think that the amount of money being talked about here by Alessandro, is that uh, adequate, realistic? What do you think? Um, so from, from our perspective, um, we obviously industry has to be right at the front in terms of uh, delivering this transition. And if you look in terms of the investment needs and the commission's calculations, I think in the a sustainable smart mobility strategy the commission talks about something like 130 billion um, euros extra investment needed per year uh, to achieve the objectives by by um, uh, in terms of the the climate goals so uh, that investment has to come from somewhere a part of it a big part of it um, has to come from industry itself um, but uh, we have to use public funds um, smartly um, and our, I guess from our perspective, uh, the, the key thing in terms of investment is that we're not against using taxpayers' funding. In fact, we advocate using taxpayers' uh, money um, in terms of recovery package funds, in terms of the European budget, to support this uh, transformation. But there must be strings attached. This isn't a blank check for industry. This is um, essentially uh, an investment in all of our futures. So the strings attached have to be that the investments are achieving a certain climate performance. And uh, we would like to see social strings attached as well in terms of the maintenance and the creation of jobs, in terms of the quality of those jobs, because this is about people's investment in the future of our economy. And therefore, we all have an incentive to ensure that that's a quality and long-term uh, sustainable investment. So from the trade union perspective, that's, that's kind of where we, we come from in terms of the investment side. The other side is coming back to um, this drum that I'm going to continue to bang on, on our need for um, an anticipation framework. If I think about the number of companies that have proactively gone out and negotiated with their own workforces strategies for um, decarbonisation. We're not talking about a big majority of companies. Um, IG Metall, our biggest uh, German affiliate, uh, did a study which showed that 57% of workers within IG Metall, so the metal manufacturing industries in Germany, including the automotive industry, um, that 57% of workers within those industries work for companies without a strategic plan for how to decarbonize. So we're talking not just about the big companies, but also about smaller uh, companies um, in the supply chain. What we need uh, from companies is the engagement to get round the table, to co-design the strategy, um, to work out how uh, we translate uh, European targets into national policies, into regional policies, into company policies. It's really a coordinated framework um, that we're, um, we're demanding, not just from policymakers, but also from our industry counterparts, because in that way we will be able to manage this change. Um, and I agree with uh, Benjamin uh, to an extent that the pace of the change has to be, has to allow that engagement and has to allow that um, management. But if we get the right pieces of the jigsaw puzzle um, in place, then our members are um, recognized that, you know, we may be able to move quicker. Things may move quicker if you get the jigsaw puzzle fitted together right. 
Um, but at the moment, we have key parts of this uh, policy jigsaw puzzle which are missing, undiscussed, or um, are underdeveloped. So that's what we're um, looking for from the, uh, from the Commission on the 14th of July or whenever, whenever it comes, that they really think about how all of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit together. Well, you mentioned that public financing should come with strings attached. Uh, and that's where I think the whole idea of uh, technology neutrality starts to get a little more complicated, right? Because the strings can be seen as uh, inhibiting that. And I think that's a good segue to our questions from the audience, all of which so far are about this issue of technology <laughs> neutrality. Um, so let me take this first question from an anonymous questioner. It's a question for the panel. Benjamin, why don't I have you take this one? Uh, so would you consider that with properly implemented technological neutrality principles, industry would ensure transition on its own? Or should certain amounts of public funding ch be channeled to large industrial enterprises to ensure much faster transition than a market-based uh, approach would? One would assume that there is a difference of at least five to 10 years of much cleaner activities and millions of tons of CO2 saved in that time. So Benjamin, what do you think about this idea that funding should be channeled to large industrial enterprises because they have the capacity to make this transition faster? Well, when funding is about to be channeled to specifically members of our industry, uh, probably I would look at the entire structure, not only the large ones. Uh, that would, of course, never be uh, something that we regard as negative. But joking aside, uh, we will need uh, we will need financing. Uh, for specific challenges, to, to help overcome specific challenges. Uh, this includes certainly research and development, uh, innovation and research uh, in areas that are not yet absolutely close to the market and where products are not yet uh, immediately visible, uh, so where the return on investment is uh, a bit further down the line. That's a traditional area uh, where there is good work being done uh, with funding. There will also be a need to overcome uh, challenges on the way to scaling up new technologies, uh, where you have incumbents in the market which are given their position able to compete on a different level than newcomers. And yes, they're intelligently applied funding can help overcome challenges. What I would be very careful about uh, is, the, is the notion that we can, with funding and redistribution of funds, uh, over the long term achieve a competitive industry and uh, solutions that are adapted to the needs of those who need them, to the consumers, at prices that are on the, 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 the most affordable level uh, that is possible. So on the, I don't think that subsidies and funding over the long term is an ideal solution. We must not forget that we need the market powers, that we need a competition in order to bring prices down and to ensure that investments are made in a way that is the most effective and efficient possible. And there, and I know that this might sound a little bit old fashioned, but nevertheless, I think it is worth uh, remembering these ideas every once in a while. There, the competition in the market is the best tool that we have to ensure that investments are made in a prudent way. Otherwise, there will always be inefficiencies. It will be more costly uh, than, 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 it might, uh, than it might need to be. So again, uh, there are very good destinations for uh, public funding. Research and development is one. Uh, achieving scale is another one. But once we are in a situation uh, where there are markets really created that can live on their own. This needs to be the, uh, the, the objective. 
then such funding should take uh, a backseat uh, or should be, should be directed to other uh, more needy objectives. But we need to ensure that we allow this competition in the marketplace. Alessandro, what do you think about this idea that having a completely market-based approach might be missing out on a more logical way to give out funding to the largest companies that can make the, the changes the fastest? I, I would not subscribe to uh, making privileged uh, lanes, let's say fast lanes, for uh, depending on the size of the enterprise. Uh, similar to what Benjamin said, I think it's the, the market to decide. So good idea comes from whatever kind of enterprise or whatever kind of, uh, uh, of organizations. Uh, I think that should be really a, a competition, a, an open competition between uh, everybody who is able to make proposals, so to contribute in a new way, because we need a lot of innovation to the decarbonization, to the huge challenge we have. So the, the, the funds that are, are being made available, and that's really uh, a huge advantage that uh, Europe has decided to, to afford uh, to its industry. This has to be used wisely. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't see that some are more, uh, let's say, should have a privileged access to them than others. Okay, so we have another question that's come in on this issue of technology neutrality, and it's specifically related to the taxonomy question. So this is, the European Commission is going to define what is a green investment, and it's for the purposes of uh, sustainable finance, but its implications will reach way beyond sustainable finance, because we're assuming that this taxonomy is going to be used to define green investments across a wide swathe of EU policy, including the budget, maybe including the recovery funding. Um, so the question is, and I'll, whoever would like to answer this can, uh, there has been strong references to the principle of technology neutrality in all the interventions so far. Do you believe that the sustainable finance and taxonomy could significantly, significantly impact that principle? So in other words, if the taxonomy is giving preference to certain technologies because they're, they've been defined as green, are we getting away from the principle of sustainable uh, of technology neutrality? would like to take that? Well, I can start yeah. with a kind yeah. of general comment, um, if you like, that um, clearly the taxonomy um, is important in terms of we know the scale of the investment which is needed and we know that we need to be driving investment towards um, uh, sustainable um, industries and technologies and ensuring that money is, is uh, heading where it has to go. I think the, the danger is uh, that within the taxonomy framework, um, there some of the, um, the levels which have been set uh, for different sectors have been drawn from other legislative frameworks which weren't related um, to, uh, to necessarily just clean investment. So that has been a problem in a number of the sectors that we represent as industrial Europe. And I think uh, what we need to be ensuring is that with technology neutrality, we also learn from where it's happening. So I would take the example of California, for example, where there's a, a big advance in terms of the decarbonization of uh, road transport and automotive. Their technology neutrality is a fundamental pillar of the, the framework. And what it's meant is that actually different part, different segments of the industry have led on the technology which is uh, the most uh, cost effective, the, the most efficient in terms of decarbonization. So we've seen electrification leading, for example, in passenger cars, um, e-fuels e and, um, and uh, renewable fuels leading and hydrogen leading in um, heavy uh, duty. But there hasn't been a silo effect um, in terms of the industry. So actually, those as the, uh, the technologies become more cost effective, the transfer within transport uh, modes and within vehicles has happened to, in, which has actually created that competition. It's created the opportunity uh, for innovation. It's created um, the, the spillover effects, if you like, between different parts of the mobility ecosystem and the development of, um, 
of, uh, of liquid fuels alongside um, electricity. What I wouldn't like to see in a European taxonomy framework is that we try and put all of our peas in the same pot. Um, because the danger is that then we will make a bet which doesn't work down the line and we'll actually lose the opportunity that innovation, you know, everything we've been talking about, that the innovation in industry could actually lead to some globally competitive um, technologies which we can export from Europe uh, to benefit the rest of the world in decarbonisation um, as well. So the taxonomy framework for us is really important as a steering for investment but we have to make sure that it doesn't become a, um, a straitjacket in some ways, um, actually cutting off the possibility for innovation and, and industrial development in areas which we, in the future, we may really benefit from. Uh, Benjamin, let's go to you next. Do you think there's a risk with this taxonomy exercise that we're violating the principle of technology neutrality? Well, inherently, uh, we are picking some winners and losers there, yes. On the other hand side, uh, it's not legally binding, at least not formally. It's about what can be regarded as, uh, as sustainable and what not. Um, so in, in that sense, I would say, yes, this question has some justification uh, and this should, be, this should be part of the discussion. Another interesting aspect in the taxonomy debate is, of course, uh, once we connect a certain criteria to the flow of money, that creates uh, some, some wishes and desires. And I think uh, we have seen this in the discussion amongst member states in the Council, um, which sources of, uh, of energy production, uh, be it nuclear for some, be it gas for others, uh, then had to be included into the, de the, the definition of, um, of what is sustainable and what would be regarded as okay under taxonomy. So once we start defining these criteria, there is an inherent risk that these are being politicized, and this we have already seen. And then we risk moving away from the, uh, from the intended objectives behind this exercise. So whether this can be resolved or not, uh, that remains to be seen, I think. Uh, I think the best way of, uh, of at least mitigating such a risk is uh, an honest, open and transparent debate about, uh, about these criteria. Yeah, as you note, it's, it's, it's not binding technically, but of course we know that when you create financial incentives, it can be basically the same thing. Alessandro, what do you think about this? Well, I, I have to say that uh, we are concerned about the, the developments on the taxonomy and the sustainable finance. And disappointingly so, because we, we fully agree with the objective of the sustainable finance policy. Uh, actually, what, what we want to, to achieve, we want to channel uh, the resources, uh, the financial resources of, uh, of the economy to investments that are consistent with the ultimate goal the climate neutrality in 2050. And of course, we fully subscribe to that. This is the, the purpose, this is the objective of the sustainable finance. Now, the problem comes when you um, deviate from this principle, when you start applying um, ideologically driven considerations, or, uh, how can I say, when you, you move away from the world we have repeated many times today, the technology neutrality. To give you a concrete example, when we prepared our clean fuels for all with our members, so this strategy for the transformation of refineries, uh, we, we asked ourselves, uh, the 650 billion we are talking about, can, we con can they be considered uh, compatible with the sustainable finance, uh, i.e. with the, the um, uh, climate neutrality in 2050? And our answer was yes, of course all of them, because we, we, we transform a, a machine fed by petroleum in a machine fed by sustainable uh, biomass, recycled CO2 waste, to make the same product that our economy needs. So uh, we think that it corresponds fully to what the sustainable finance should be. We see difficulties, we need an open dialogue, we are 
would be very, we will be very happy to contribute to, to this dialogue, but please uh, let's not have uh, ideological rigidity. Uh -huh. So uh, we have a question that's come in for Benjamin. Uh, so the questioner asks, it takes significantly less work to manufacture an electric car compared to an ICE vehicle. How, to, how do we avoid job losses in the automotive industry in this context? I think that relates back to, uh, that points, to points that have already been made in the discussion. I will try not to uh, not, not to reiterate too much uh, what we said before. So yes, it is less work intensive. Uh, there will be new jobs uh, in the respective new supply chains, be it on software development, be it on the electrification of the powertrain itself, be it in batteries. Um, so the expectation, it depends very much on the studies that we're looking at. Uh, the expectation is either a break even we come up with as many new jobs as uh, as old jobs are lost, or there is a risk uh, that there will be a net loss in employment uh, if we were to go towards full electrification of the drivetrain, uh, of the powertrain, uh, in, in a short amount of time. So what is important in this context? The transition is ongoing, that's undeniably true. Uh, we are all engaged in uh, taking the challenges really heads on, but the transition needs to, um, to stay at a pace that remains manageable, also on the social side. Uh, what would be a contribution uh, to, well, what would be a more, more pragmatic way forward uh, is the famous technology open regulatory framework where we do not prescribe the technology that can be used in vehicles, but we leave it to the market to find the best solutions. And if there is a niche where a, a hybrid engine in a, uh, in a vehicle is the better solution, for example, in long distance travel or for heavy, uh, heavy goods vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, uh, and this is the more efficient solution and the cheaper solution, then there is actually no justification in not going that way, not allowing uh, this way forward. As long as we achieve the objectives, uh, as long as the CO2 emissions from transport go down effectively, and as long as we are on a trajectory towards climate neutrality in 2050, this is undeniably shared as the objective. But in the end, the climate doesn't care where and how CO2 is reduced as long as we effectively do it. And there we believe we have a strong role for low and zero carbon fuels in the future. Again, uh, for Alessandro to, to shed a bit of light on the, the path forward as uh, projected by, by Fuels Europe on how to achieve this. But then uh, the combustion engine uh, with hybrid technology can be as climate neutral as a battery electric vehicle running on green fuel, uh, running on green electricity. And this pragmatism is an important factor in ensuring that a transition towards climate neutrality, towards defossilized mobility, uh, stays at a manageable pace uh, and that we ensure also employment and the power to innovate and a competitive industry in, uh, in, within the European Union in the future. Well, Benjamin, you mentioned pace, and that relates to this last question that I'll take from the audience, and I'll put this to both Alessandro and Judith. Uh, so the questioner asks, do you think it's important to go that companies go faster or slower to sustainable development and reaching the sustainable goals than they are right now? And if you think it's necessary to go faster, is it then necessary to give them a little more pressure? Judith, I'll put that to you first. Well, I guess... Uh the, the point is that we want um, more speed, less haste. Um, and that means uh, that you do it in a managed way. If it's in a, a managed framework, it's possible to make substantive changes relatively quickly. We're seeing that in many of the, the companies um, that are announcing very ambitious plans, particularly the OEMs. Um, who are announcing ambitious plans for their transformation um, with very ambitious timetables. 
but you have to have the, the framework right. So um, I'm, like I said right at the beginning, we as trade unions, we're far more concerned with the how than when, with the when, if you like. It's not so much the target, but actually how are we going to have a practical roadmap and plan to achieve that objective in 2050. Clearly, and I, I've said that already, um, we need all companies uh, to be engaging in a dialogue with their workforce around how they play their role in getting to 2050. And some of them will be able to set out very ambitious plans, and that's brilliant. And I'm sure that our members and the workers in those companies will be um, actively supporting the, as, you know, that speed rather than the haste. So that would be my, uh, my reflection on, on pace. Speed versus haste. I think it's an interesting distinction. Alessandro, what do you think? Uh, I fully support what Judith said. We need to do it right. But said that for the sector I represent, uh, we, we have a wealth, a big number of uh, initiatives uh, announced or already on stream, already realized, uh, from the pilot plant to even industrial applications. And just to mention, we, we have uh, three or uh, soon four biorefineries in Europe, the, the first in the world. So a, a conventional refinery converted to a machine to make uh, uh, carbon neutral fuels you know, with, uh, bio, based on biogenic CO2. It's there. We need to scale up. We have no time to lose, absolutely. It's, it's, it's an emergency climate. Uh, and we need the policy framework that makes it available. So we have to do it right. We have no time to lose at all. Our industry is putting all their efforts in that. Uh, we need the policy framework right to, to unlock the full potential of this revolution. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our panelists here and remote uh, for some excellent uh, introductions. Thanks so much. Let me tell you guys at home about the remaining three web webinars we have in the series. On Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we're having the webinar on feedstock availability and sustainability review. On Friday at 10 o'clock, <clears throat> we're having the webinar on ensuring social inclusiveness. And then <clears throat> on Monday, a week from now, we have at 10 o'clock uh, the final webinar, <clears throat> which is at about urban air quality, what impact on urban air quality. So be sure to tune in for those. And if you'd like to watch any of the webinars that have already happened, you can find them on uh, the Fuels Europe YouTube page. They're all there, or you can find them also on the, the events page as well. So thank you so much for spending your morning with us, and we'll see you on Wednesday for the next webinar in this series. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.